a new topic um, that's very much related to um, the last part of the endocrine system when we were talking about the endocrine stress response. I'm going to go back and pick up um, the nervous system response, including stress, but not limited to. So in this um, relatively short set of notes, um, we're going to compare the autonomic nervous system to the somatic motor nervous system. And then um, right after this material, we go into um, the uh, muscular system, skeletal muscle, which is controlled by the somatic motor nervous system. So um, first, let's um, make sure that you do the before you begin here. You need to, for instance, know what a ganglion is, know what a nerve is, know what PNS, CNS, all that kind of stuff is. I'm going to review a tiny bit of it at the beginning, but you do need to probably brush off some anatomy. Okay, so let's go to Roman numeral two. And before we start talking about where we're going to be today, which is really kind of here and here, really in the efferent nervous system, let's just back up a little bit and talk um, globally about the function of the nervous system. Um, uh, it's really working with the endocrine system, which we just talked about, um, to be one of the body's two major control and communication systems. Um, and a lot of times what it is trying to do is to help maintain homeostasis. Of course, it's more complicated than that, but quite often that's one of the goals of the nervous system. Um, and it does that primarily by doing three things, by doing sensation, which is information in, um, integration, which is processing the information after it's come in, and then response, um, which it's initiating an action quite often to maintain homeostasis. So if you use a super simple example, like putting your hand on a hot stove. If you put your hands on a hot stove, you need to fix the problem in order to maintain homeostasis. Don't burn to a crisp. So how do you do it? Information in, which is sensation. That's nervous system moving information toward the central nervous system. Integration is all the way back to that reflex arc stuff we talked about. The integration center compares the actual with the idea and it says hot. Hmm, identify, identified it. How hot? Too hot. Big error signal. And then um, if it's too hot, then you're going to need to initiate a response by sending information out. And um, that is the motor activity. So um, where we're kind of going to be concentrating today is this part, um, the motor activity. So let me just remind you of a couple of things that you already know about neurons before we go any further. Um, and when we learned about membrane potentials, we learned that neurons have the ability to take, for instance, a chemical st stimulus and convert it to an electrical stimulus called an action potential. Um, and they can do that um, because they have um, voltage-gated ion channels on um, their cell membranes. Um, muscles also can do that. We haven't talked about action potentials in muscles yet, but that's next. Um, neurons also have one other special characteristic, which we haven't spent much time talking about, but we will. It's called conductivity, meaning that neurons can make other cells have an action potential because neurons actually have the ability to release neurotransmitters. And we will do neurotransmitters relatively quickly after muscles. Okay, so I want to talk about the functional organization of the peripheral nervous system. Not so much like what, what nerve is called what, but what is it actually doing? So let's talk about the functional organization of the peripheral nervous system. So if you look at this figure, which is figure 7-1 in your textbook, we basically have the PNS, the peripheral nervous system, and the central nervous system. The central nervous system is complicated as hell. It's just represented right here by a box saying brain and spinal cord. Um, most of the integration goes on in the central nervous system. But if you look at the peripheral nervous system, it's not doing any appreciable amount of integration. Mostly it's doing input, which is sensation, and output, which is motor activity. Um, so let's talk about sensation briefly. Um, there's a lot that you could say about sense, um, sensory systems. Um, I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on it just because we run out of time in physiology if I do. But um, Every sense that you ever have goes to the central nervous system for integration because there's no reason to gather the information if you're not going to send it for integration. But interestingly, 
you may or may not ever be consciously aware of the things that you are sensing. For instance, right now, I am sensing my own blood pressure, but I'm not sending it to a part of my brain that will become aware that I ever sensed it because it goes to my medulla oblongata. Whereas if I do this, right, I am sensing um, touch on my hand and I'm sending it to the cerebral cortex, you only become aware of senses that go to your cerebral cortex because that's your conscious portion of your brain. Anywhere else, send it to the spinal cord, no awareness. Send it to the medulla oblongata, even the hypothalamus, you still got no awareness. So even though all of this is going in there, it doesn't mean you know about it. Okay, but where we're going to be in this set of notes is primarily in this part of the um, peripheral nervous system, which is the efferent division. So afferent in, efferent out. And it's actually pronounced afferent and efferent, but I'm twanging it up so you can hear the difference. The efferent division um, of the um, of the peripheral nervous system carries information in the form of action potentials away from the central nervous system to what we call effectors. So the effectors are the things that you can effect a change upon, and it's generally going to be muscles and glands. Okay, so um, let's talk about the simple one first, and then I'll stop this video and go on to the more complicated one. So the somatic nervous system, uh, often abbreviated um, SNS, or the somatic division of the efferent nervous system, carries information, action potentials out to skeletal muscle to command their contraction. So the other way of saying that is that skeletal muscle is the effector for the somatic motor division of the peripheral nervous system. Now, um, what kind of control do you have over skeletal muscle? Well, they Often people call the somatic nervous system the voluntary division, and it's usually voluntary, but it's not always voluntary. Like right now, my diaphragm, my diaphragm is skeletal muscle, but I can't hold my breath to death um, because my brain won't let me. Um, and sometimes skeletal muscles behave involuntarily, like when you're shivering. So it's usually voluntary. Um, because most of the somatic nervous system is controlled or mapped to the cerebral cortex. Um, so let me remind you of something that you may or may not have learned in anatomy. I teach it in anatomy, if I can get my mouse to work. Come on, mouse. Okay, um, so there are a portion of the cerebral cortex called the motor cortex. Um, and the motor cortex, also called the primary motor cortex. Sorry, I was trying to get this to come on. Um, the primary motor cortex, you do not have to memorize this picture, but for those of you who liked this part of anatomy, and I love this part of, of anatomy, um, I just want to show you that basically the cerebral cortex is going to this portion of the cerebral cortex, meaning um, it's hooked up to the voluntary portion of your brain is actually going to send a signal out to skeletal muscle fibers. So this is your somatic pathway or somatic motor pathway that you've got here. And for that reason, because the cerebral cortex is hooked up to skeletal muscle fibers, you can most of the time control them voluntarily. And also please remember that really the left side of your brain controls the right side, the right side of your brain controls the left side. It can get more complicated than this, but at least uh, you have the potential of voluntary control with the somatic nervous system. So um, now I want to talk about how to get there. So it's actually relatively simple. Once you get down to um, the neuron that's going to control the skeletal muscle fibers, it pretty much goes straight. This motor neuron, the somatic motor neuron, it goes straight from the gray matter out to the muscle fibers. So let's simplify it and just look at that one. Once I get to the somatic motor neuron, the somatic motor neuron is going to be somewhere in the gray matter of the central nervous system. And then one axon, just one, goes all the way out to the skeletal muscle fibers. So the anatomical route from the CNS to skeletal muscle is very simple. We have one, here we go, I'm reading here and looking here, and there's also a figure we're gonna fill in in your um, notes in just a second. This somatic motor neuron cell body is in the CNS, okay? 
generally in the gray matter of the brain, the spinal cord. The axon is going to go through a nerve. I don't know which one, because I don't know which skeletal muscle this is. And then it's going to form synapse uh, at skeletal muscle, what uh, the place that we call the neuromuscular junction. There's only one synapse on the way, one motor neuron, one synapse on the way. The neurotransmitter that we're going to use here is really the best known neurotransmitter called um, acetylcholine. And you're going to release it here at these synapses called neuromuscular ju junctions. And the effect on skeletal muscle is always going to be excitatory because um, acetylcholine will bind to and open ligand gated sodium channels and therefore depolarize the skeletal muscle fiber. So the mechanism of excitation is generally going to be to open sodium channels and cause depolarization. These synapses, when we get there, they would be called cholinergic, which is just a fancy word um, that uh, means releasing or responding to acetylcholine. So now you have this in your notes. I'm gonna fill it in so that you guys can see what goes there. Okay, so let me show you. Okay, so basically I want you to be able to do what we just did, which is just basically fill this thing in. Okay, so basically the, what this is trying to show you is that um, you have in the central nervous system, the neuron cell body, right? And then through the per peripheral nervous system, not drawn in as much detail as that other one did because we're trying to simplify this. You just have axons that run through the peripheral nervous system and then release neurotransmitters. And what neurotransmitter am I going to use? The neurotransmitter that's always used right there is acetylcholine. acetylcholine. And the effector for the somatic nervous system is, that's what that's trying to show you, is skeletal muscle. And then the effect is always, always, always excitatory. Now, it doesn't mean you're always going to have an action potential or always have a contraction. What it means is that it's depolarizing and it's more likely to, it's going to depolarize and get closer to threshold. The muscle fiber will contract if threshold is reached, and we'll talk about muscle contraction in the next set of notes. Okay. So I want you to use that as a comparison contrast to move into the next one. We'll stop there and then I'll start the next one with the autonomic nervous system.